Um, over the next uh, 20 minutes, I'm going to talk to you uh, about this uh, clearly very important topic. But although important, it's an incredibly broad subject that I've been asked to cover and impossible to cover in the 20 minutes uh, that have been allocated. So what I've done is I've tried to select some well, key topics to, to cover and discuss. And, and of course, anything that's in the review article that I haven't mentioned, I'm happy to discuss um, after the presentation. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight before I begin uh, uh, the, my talk is, is the evidence that's available out there is very broad. M multiple definitions for dehydration, euhydration, and indeed overhydration, and different methodologies used. And as a result of that, the results that have been reported uh, from various studies that have been conducted are uh, somewhat uh, inconsistent. I'm just going to give a brief background, um, then I'll discuss some conditions associated with dehydration and then overhydration, and then I, um, I'll conclude at the end. Um, dehydration is important. It's linked with morbidity and mortality. There's a, a large multi-center study uh, from the United States um, in old adults that reported a 17% 30-day mortality associated with a primary diagnosis of dehydration. They also reported a 50% one-year mortality, again associated with a primary diagnosis of dehydration. Um, we know that um, a recent, well, not so recent now, but a heat wave that affected France in 2003 resulted in significant increases in mortality rate in Paris. Their morta mortality rate went up by 142%, with the most vulnerable groups um, at highest risk. And often the morbidity and mortality was related to um, heat-related illness, like dehydration. Overhydration is also linked to morbidity and mortality. We've heard about it most commonly uh, in, uh, as a result of iatrogenic fluid overload, and that's something that we come across a lot in surgical patients. But it's also been reported in healthy or seemingly healthy individuals like athletes, uh, particularly in the context of hyponatremia. So I'll begin by talking about uh, dehydration. There are many conditions or many systems that are reported to be affected by dehydration. Although I apologize for the small text, I just wanted to highlight there are many topics, and um, we will just focus on a few of those. Um, I'm aware that we have a talk about uh, renal pathology in the context of hydration, um, but urolithiasis, urinary tract infections, uh, and bladder cancer have also been uh, reported in the context uh, of dehydration. Uh, the strongest evidence of this is in the context of urolithiasis. There's been uh, one randomized control trial that looked at that. Um, but um, urinary tract infection, again, there's some evidence uh, linking uh, dehydration to UTIs. And although there is evidence, it's inconsistent. Um, but despite this, many uh, physicians still recommend um, high fluid intake in though as a prophylactic me measure for urinary tract infection, but also as an adjunct to uh, conventional treatment. The uh, NICE recommend, uh, that's the National Institute of Health Research, recommend that, uh, particularly in children that um, suffer urinary tract in uh, infections, that adequate hydration needs to, needs to be maintained. Um, I won't talk too much about bladder cancer because of, uh, uh, because of the time restrictions, but I'm happy to discuss that at, at the end. Um, gastrointestinal conditions, um, constipation, bowel cancer, and gallstones. I'll focus on the first two because that's where there's more evidence. With regards to gallstones, the evidence is largely associative. Um, there's no real studies that have looked at uh, a direct relationship. So with regards to constipation, it's thought that in a state of dehydration results in increased fluid absorption from the stool, which, re which leads to infrequent stool, and leads to hard stool, which is more difficult to pass. This, there's also a theory that suggests that um, dehydration results in reduced bowel transit time. Now, there was a, a study in um, healthy male volunteers where they were prescribed uh, standardized nutrition and physical activity, and then they were randomized either uh, receiving um, or restricted to uh, half a litre of fluid per day for a week, 
or, or two and a half litres per day um, for a week. And, and then they had a two-week crossover and crossed over to the opposite arm. And what that study showed is that there was a significant reduction in stool uh, weight and frequency during the period of fluid restriction. But it also showed that when the subjects returned to normal fluid habits, that resolved. So the bowel habits returned to normal. There's also some evidence linking the uh, li linking increased fluid consumption, particularly water, um, with reduced um, uh, laxative need for laxatives, particularly osmotic laxatives in children. There's also one study that demonstrated that um, increased water consumption results in increased uh, um, activity or, in or more effective activity of um, fibre in a diet. So they randomised. Uh, uh, two groups of people that suffer from functional constipation to a standardized fiber, high fiber diet. And then one group, uh, group one, they drank uh, fluid as they, as they would do normally, whereas group two were randomized to drinking a minimum of 2.1 uh, liters of fluid per day, or uh, roughly about two liters of fluid per day. Uh, and they demonstrated that um, you can see here significant differences in the um, stool frequency uh, in, that, in that context. And the graph at the bottom here demonstrates that um, with increased fluid changes or increase in fluid consumption, there's um, increased in, in the um, uh, stool frequency. With regards to colorectal cancer, it's thought that reduced bowel transit time and constipation is a major risk factor. Um, and that's because it thought to increase the um, contact time with potential off potential carcinogens <laughs> with the bowel mucosa and, uh, and animal model, mo uh, models have supported that uh, in rats in particular where constipation and reduced bowel transit time was associated with um, neoplastic transformation of, um, of the bowel mucosa. There have been three main studies that I'm aware of all case control retrospective uh, studies and one particular study reported that those who reported who who uh, said that they consumed an average of five glasses of water per day had a significant uh, le uh, significant uh, risk reduction of cancer compared to those who consumed two. One study from um, Taiwan uh, looked at the same thing. So the, the 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 first study was from Seattle, and the relationship was mostly demonstrated in women, uh, but there was no significant differences in men. This one here is from Taiwan, and they looked at the same thing. They looked at moderate, uh, high, and uh, low fluid consumption, and they demonstrated that particularly with regards to um, lower uh, uh, cancers, which is particularly rectal cancer, there was a significant dose response, uh, inverse dose response, in, in relation to water consumption. So the more water uh, the subjects reported to have consumed, that was associated with um, a reduced risk of cancer. And the relationship was most... Uh, prominent in men but not women and this is adjusted for various factors like age, BMI and other known uh, risk factors for colon cancer. Um, they, they, I also had to highlight they rep didn't report anything significant in, in, in women. So just moving on now to cardiovascular disease, um, we know that dehydration uh, inc results in increased plasma viscosity um, we also know that increased plasma viscosity is a major risk factor for thrombogenic events or thrombogenesis in general. Um, and people at risk are those uh, with underlying, or particularly at risk, are those with underlying hematological disorders like myeloma and, and um, polycythemia, where they, where they have a, a background risk of, inc of increased plasma viscosity anyway. Um, patients or, with sickle cell disease are also at increased risk of um, thrombogenic events in the context of dehydration. Um, that, that's thought to be a slightly different mechanism where dehydration is thought to result in increased red cell uh, aggregation. And in, in, incidentally, one study demonstrated that um, normal erythrocytes, when dehydrated, also result in increased um, demonstrate adhesive properties similar to that seen in sickle cell. And for that reason, um, we, the, the, the theory is that um, patients uh, with uh, or bec that become dehydrated um, are, are at increased risk of thrombogenic events. There's been some papers or some studies that have linked uh, uh, deep vein thrombosis, cerebral infarction, and myocardial infarction with, with dehydration. In the case of DVT, there's only one real study uh, that looked at this, and it looked at a group of patients that were admitted to hospital following an ischemic stroke. 
Um, and basically what they demonstrated is that those who, uh, their, their plasma or osmolality um, on, uh, within the first two days of admission um, of greater than 297 as well as a raised uh, urea creatinine ratio um, was associated with um, higher risks of um, deep vein thrombosis. With regards to cerebral infarct, um, the studies that have demonstrated that dehydration may be a, a risk factor in this, in this condition, or, or, and, and basically th there's only one real study that that's looked at that, uh, and this is uh, from uh, Tokyo, a group from Tokyo, uh, many years back. They, looked, they, they did post-mortem examinations in about 500 patients. About 100 of those had uh, died from uh, stroke, uh, about... 30 of those were um, from hemorrhagic stroke and 70 from um, ischemic stroke. And basically, they looked at admission serum osmolality. Uh, sorry, they looked at admission hematocrit. And you can see here that uh, the dotted line is those who have had a cerebral hemorrhage. The, the solid line is those who have had an infarct. And the hematocrit um, was significantly higher, or there's a greater proportion of those with ischemic stroke who have higher uh, hematocrit. They then went on to look at those with ischemic stroke in more detail, and they looked at the atherosclerosis in the cerebral vessels. Um, so this, the two pluses is severe, one plus is um, moderate, and uh, this negative here is no atherosclerosis. And you can see here that, again, with raised, there were a greater proportion of people um, with uh, raised hematocrit that had severe um, atherosclerosis um, compared to moderate and here there were not, no, none in this, in this group here. Now, there's also some evidence to link dehydration with poor outcome in people who have had um, cere ischemic cerebral, cerebral infarcts. So one study looked at um, uh, basically osmolality um, as a marker of dehydration, uh, that serum osmolality, uh, and they looked at outcomes. So they looked at uh, three months uh, mortality and function using a, the Barthel ADL in, uh, a activities of daily living index. And what they demonstrated that um, dehydration was associated with poor outcome uh, in these patients. It's not only mortality, but also this, the, the osmolality in the people that had um, functional disability um, was greater um, than those who, who didn't have any functional disability. And similarly with uh, myocardial infarction, again, some evidence there. Um, this is from, uh, there's one ma main study, really. It, it's, uh, it's called the, Ad I think, the Adventist Health Study. Um, and they recruited adults who didn't have a background of cardio uh, cardiovascular disease. And they looked at, uh, the content, looked at water and um, the rates of fatal cardiac events. And, and basically, what they demonstrated is um, in this model here, which is adjusted for many things, including age, um, uh, comorbidities, uh, smoke and hypertension and so on, that in men, um, consumption of water, um, and I think they reported it, above, well, it is above five glasses um, on average per day, uh, compared to less than two, um, was associated with a relative risk reduction um, of uh, this event. Another study uh, also looked at uh, myocardial infarction and demonstrated that um, dehydration on admission, as measured by plasma viscosity hematocrit uh, and uh, uh, osmolality, was associated with, with poor outcome. Now, fluid overload. Fluid overload uh, or overhydration is also important. Uh, I suppose in the world of sports science, it may be called uh, fluid, uh, um, overhydration, perhaps. Uh, but certainly in, 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 in medicine, it's fluid overload. Um, it's been linked uh, with morbidity and mortality in athletes. Um, some people um, have suggested that overhydration results in hyponatremia, but, um, and obviously severe hyponatremia is associated with brain edema and mortality. However, I think we need, to, before we can make that assumption, I think one needs to be clear uh, on all the different factors that can influence that. Um, it's not just um, water consumption, you've got to think about the, late, uh, the rate of sodium loss, uh, amongst other factors. 
With regards to iatrogenic fluid overload, um, it, it's, it's really quite a big issue at the moment. Uh, certainly it's improving, but in, the in, in 1999, the UK confidential inquiry into post-operative death highlighted that the most common avoidable cause of post-operative morbidity and mortality was fluid imbalance, in particular fluid overload. The morbidity and mortality associated with fluid overload is, is largely related to inadequate or, or wrong prescriptions. Uh, and one study reported that some surgical patients received up to five litres of excess uh, water and 500 yeah. millimoles yeah. of excess sodium uh, and chloride. This can obviously predispose to heart failure, pulmonary edema, and even some, uh, some studies have su suggested renal impairment. It's associated with increased post-operative complications and increased length of hospital stay. Uh, a meta-analysis uh, by one of my colleagues um, looked at all the randomized control trials that uh, investigated intravenous fluid prescriptions in patients undergoing um, open elective uh, major abdominal surgical, surgical procedures. And they, they highlighted that the key optimum um, is normal volemia. That is what patient, that's what we should all be aiming for. They also highlighted that with normal volemia, there is a 41% reduction in complications and the reduction in length of stay by 3.4 days. And this image demonstrates that. Um, you can see that with hypervolemia, there's many complications. With hypovolemia, many complications also there. And the key is to try and be close to zero fluid balance. And from our experience, monitoring fluid input and output in all of our patients is the key to aiding um, adequate fluid prescription. I've, I just picked a couple of systems just to focus on briefly, uh, similar to what I did with dehydration. In surgery, the, the physiological response to surgery is salt and water retention. If you give people excess fluid, this results in edema, not only in the peripheries, but also in the gastrointestinal tract, in the myocardium, in the lungs. Increased abdominal edema has been shown to result in reduced blood flow in the splanchnic vessels. It's, it's, and it's also been reported in the context of um, even reduced renal blood flow. This results in prolonged post-operative ileus, which is gastric stasis associated with morbidity. Some studies have also demonstrated that over-prescribing of fluids results in swelling of the anastomosis where the bowel has been resected and joined back together. Now, that result, that, this edema can result in anastomotic dehiscence, which can be a life-threatening event. It really is a serious complication. DVTs have also been reported in the context of fluid overload. I have mentioned them briefly uh, br uh, before with, in the context of dehydration. Um, they're very common, common in surgical patients and again, uh, very important to be aware of uh, the, the effects of overhydration on DVT. Um, one study has demonstrated that um, overhydration or hemodilution results in um, dysfunction or, or the decreased activity of some anticoagulant factors like antithrombin-3. And obviously that predisposes to, a thrombo to thrombogenesis. One study done many years back looked at uh, patients undergoing elective major abdominal surgery. They randomized one group to receiving uh, liberal intravenous fluid therapy before or after the operation. The other group uh, received no, no fluids, no intravenous fluids at all. And they demonstrated that within the fluid restricted group, the prevalence of deep vein thrombosis was um, uh, 7%. And in the, f the liberal uh, re uh, re regime, rather, the, the incidence was 30%. So significant differences. DVTs can result, again, in, in you know, major morbidity. Now, before I can conclude, I feel I ought to mention a really important topic of the impact of hydration status um, on drugs. We know that alteration in hydration status affects pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics. And 
in athletes, if we take them as an example, many athletes take uh, drugs like non-steroidal non anti-inflammatories for pain relief uh, without full awareness of the possible potential renal complications. Um, we, we, there was one study that looked at uh, triathlon competitors and they highlighted that 60% of those that, that were questioned consumed uh, or took pain relief, NSAIDs for pain relief in the previous three months and less than a, a third of those were aware of the renal complications or renal side effects um, and, uh, and some of those include hyponatremia. Another really important group of patients, perhaps uh, one, ones uh, I suppose more relevant to, to, to me, are, are older adults. Um, many older adults obviously have comorbidities, but because of that, there um, they're on many medications, including diuretics. Um, and without adequate knowledge, regard, and they take them really regimentally, regardless of the, any uh, environmental change. And this, the kind of effects of that were highlighted following the heat wave in France uh, in 2003 that I mentioned earlier. There were, we talked about significant morbidity and mortality, particularly in the elderly group. But what's also, that what was also reported is that the adverse uh, inter drug events that were reported went up significantly, particularly uh, those on diuretics and, an and angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors were amongst the highest uh, or most common, uh, commonly reported adverse uh, events. So in conclusion, there, there clearly is a growing body of evidence that highlights the importance of uh, hydration status uh, uh, on health and uh, links the state of fluid imbalance with disease. However, I, ought, I feel I ought to highlight that a lot of the work is based on retrospective studies with methodologies that differ and potentially, you know, that definitely need improvement. Uh, there's a few randomized control trials. And one key aspect that needs to be addressed is the definition or, or an agreed definition of hydration, dehydration, or indeed overhydration, or e even the way that we, we assess hydration status. Some studies have looked at urine output as a primary outcome. Others have looked at osmolalities. Wh wh what is the correct um, way to go about this? And, uh, and further work is desperately needed, I feel, to address some really quite key important um, aspects. So I just want to acknowledge the support and funding I received from the European Hydration Institute and Professor Dilip Lobo and Opinda Sahota um, for their contribution to the review. Thank you. Thank you. Um, discussants are uh, Ron and myself. I start. OK. Um, when I read um, uh, your manuscript as uh, in preparation of this uh, uh, meeting, I felt I wanted to uh, sort of uh, um, step a little back and look at the whole picture. Mm. And uh, what I felt is that um, actually, as you mentioned in your conclusion, we do not have evidence, solid evidence for the associations. And um, I was wondering, is this because there is no markers available, because the experimental design is poor, because there has not been a lot of interest in this area? Wh what is your opinion? You looked at the studies. Yeah. Were you happy with the design, with the markers? Um, what is going to on? To be frank, I... <laughs> I I lost quite a bit of respect for the published literature, having read <laughs> quite a lot of things that I thought ought to have been... Mean thing um, to say. <laughs> uh, it shouldn't have been published. Um, I think that there are key things to highlight. It's difficult. Okay? It's hard to go back and uh, it's hard to do a study where you can pinpoint factors that predispose to uh, colon cancer, for instance. Um, it, it is hard. We've talked already about being able to quantify sodium intake. Um, I suspect it's even harder to try and quantify uh, water intake. It's, it's, it's we're asking people to do impossible things. But I think we have a responsibility as people who are interested in hydration and hydration-related research to make it clear that, or at least try and highlight some guidelines uh, for, for people to try and use for in, in future research. Um, we need, I think that's something that needs to be uh, clarified. There's also lots of inconsistency, and I think the inconsistency is related to two factors. Um, one is the reliability on things, methods that are not reliable, like 
uh, recall of um, fluid consumption, for instance. The other thing is about people using different markers. So in the case of urolithiasis or, or renal stones, um, there's one randomized trial that randomized people who have had a previous history of at least one stone to either um, increase fluid consumption so that they produce at least two liters of urine per day um, compared to people who are normal uh, fluid habits, and they demonstrated significant improvements with that regime. So that, I feel that was a nice, clear um, measure of hydration. So we, we've talked a lot, lot about fluid balance, uh, and I think the urine output is a good way to do it. The, some studies, like the things we talked about with DVT and the cerebral infarcts, took serum osmolality. Uh, it's, very, it's very difficult. What point do you, do you take to take that? Um, following out on, on what you have been saying, um, I was wondering whether um, a document like a scientific opinion document on how to, to, to look at these things would be of help. And I, I recall that, um, for example, in nutrition we have uh, documents like this for how to measure antioxidant status, for example. And EFSA has uh, issued uh, um, scientific opinion on how to measure cardiovascular disease, on how to measure mm -hmm. appetite mm -hmm. and weight control. Um, and I was wondering whether you think that uh, a scientific opinion document on how to measure hydration status would be of help. Absolutely. for the scientific uh, community, absolutely. like something that uh, we could agree maybe. No, I, I definitely feel that that's something that's desperately needed, not only for scientific research, but to aid clinical uh, uh, man diagnosis and management of hydration. Um, I, I, yeah, it's certainly needed. Also, um, another, another thing that occurred to me is that uh, there are a lot of um, acute and chronic uh, 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 disease that are mentioned uh, in your talk. <laughs> If, if you would like to, uh, let's say, set research priorities, would you um, pinpoint to some of them and your criteria would be public health concerns or available evidence, for example? Would you go to cardiovascular disease, which is the number one, or hypertension? Um, would you go to something that uh, there is evidence or... It's a very difficult question. I think all conditions are important. I think, I think if uh, that, that's, uh, that's key. But I think w we need to take a step back. And as I, once we, we've agreed what the guidelines are for, for assessing hydration status and what appropriate methodology should be used, I think, uh, yes, I think, I think we should start with areas where current, in current practice, many clinicians and many expert committees recommend um, increased or decreased in some cases uh, fluid consumption uh, or highlight them as, 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 as risk, risk factors or, or as beneficial for some, for some conditions. So what worries me is some, some guidelines recommend things without much evidence base and I think that's probably a good place to start because that's currently what clinicians are prescribing or working through. He's uh, interesting as someone who works with uh, surgical patients because one of his questions says, how can we protect patients from ignorance regarding water intake because surgeons push patients to drink water ad lib? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think, so I think it, it comes back to the overhydration. Well, I, 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 let me be clear with one, with one thing. I don't think there's any evidence linking over consumption, oral consumption of fluid with, with, with uh, overload in our patients. The reason our patients are overloaded, it's because we haven't got, or we have better knowledge now, but we certainly are not knowledgeable enough on, on what we're prescribing and, um, and how much we're prescribing. Um, Professor Lober did a study some years back and looking at knowledge of the most commonly prescribed drug in the hospital, which is IV fluids. And uh, you'd be surprised that a significant proportion, I can't remember the exact figures, but certainly less than half of consultants and junior trainees were aware of what, were, what was in it. The other thing is, uh, until recently, a lot of people use normal saline, and that's been shown to be quite detrimental uh, to, to various uh, systems and, and certainly contributes to, uh, to edema. So I think the problem isn't oral, in fact, we should always encourage our patients to drink orally so we can avoid intravenous fluid therapy. And in the 
it, the, the change in practice is kind of leading people to encourage oral intake very soon after surgery. I, I spent three years working in the surgery department, so nothing surprises me anymore. Um, <laughs> but we went through that 30 years ago, John. We looked at giving oral fluids and surgical patients um, versus giving IV because the default was IV at that time. Uh, the patients tolerated the oral fluids very well. They were very happy with them. They didn't have the complications you get from IV. Um, but the nursing staff didn't like it because if it's oral, it's a nursing staff responsibility. If it's IV, it's a medical staff responsibility. So the doctors were very happy with oral intake. The nursing staff made it impossible for that to continue. Yeah. How do you resolve that? I think uh, knowledge, again, it's just knowledge and awareness. Mm. Uh, the culture has changed. Uh, we, we are, particularly in our unit, uh, there's real um, clear guidelines. Uh, where we can, we encourage people to drink um, as soon as they can after surgery. Um, some years back, the advice was to keep people nil by mouth, to allow the gut to rest. That's all been shown to not, not to be the best advice now. Um, so, uh, yes, it's, it's a multidisciplinary effort uh, that, that needs to be shown some leadership, but I think knowledge and awareness is the key, key aspect. If we can show nurses that if you give patients oral fluids early rather than IV, they'll do better, they'll go home quicker, we'll, they'll make us a priority. Yeah. So the default should be oral. That absolutely. And IV that always be is the default um, at the moment, well, unless you need to replace um, certain electrolytes, certainly. But at the, in our units, anyway, that well, if they can consume oral fluids or eat and drink, that's what we should do. I was just going to ask you to clarify. That's the default in your unit. Is it recognised nationally and internationally as the default? It's the balance that is the problem, because they prescribe, but they don't look for the output, and they don't monitor clinical signs of uh, hydration. That's the point. It's lack of attention, lack of uh, supervision, because you can prescribe five liters a day after the surgery, but then you have to see what's going on, if it is going out or not. If not, what, you, you, you need to react. That's basic. I think, I, I, I don't know, I, the, the, I'm not sure I totally agree with that. I think it, what, what has been shown, there's a, I'm not an expert in it, there's a term called enhanced recovery after surgery. Uh, and, and what the evidence shows that if you can get people to normal eating and drinking habits, even after bowel surgery, they always do better. Um, the, the, pro the problem is, if you start prescribing people at the default intra intravenous fluids, you're open to all the problems that you get with that. Not, not only is it the fluids and there's a cannula in place and associated complications to that. So we find that if you can get people to eat and drink, and, and I, I'm sure there are national and international guidelines that recommend this, um, it's always better for the patient, providing they're absorbing enough fluids. Yeah, and then there's a reason why they don't go to this uh, level. They probably don't recover. They, they don't uh, recover very well from the surgery. This is why they uh, do not start eating and drinking after the surgery, after the short period. First, you need to start the uh, peristalsis to, to, to work. That's it. The intestine don't work. You don't give any fluid, any, uh, anything uh, orally. So if they don't recover because of complications, because of infection, whatever, you cannot go. And these people really have uh, worse prognosis. That's obvious. That, and uh, this, is, this is something that uh, you have to take into account. And if you put everybody into the same uh, box and uh, you mix them up, you have very difficult and very difficult to uh, interpret results. That's exactly what is the problem, one of the problems in literature. They put everybody together, they don't look for the differences, and then they, um, they take the um, conclusions, as you mentioned, as prescription. It's not. It's the balance and the lack of uh, supervision. Um, uh, potentially, I think in some cases that's got, that's got the case. But I, I think it, there's, there's been a cultural change in surgery, um, and it's not just in our units. It's it's, it's across the country, um, and, and it really is to try and encourage people to to if they can, if their gut is functioning, to get them to eat and drink. The, the two reasons for that is they do they do. It's been shown they do better. They absorb the right things, and you don't overload them not only with fluid, but also the, the concern is the sodium and, and particularly the chloride that you that you get with intravenous fluid therapy. The chlorides do not give you that much uh, problems 
with these amounts uh, infused, because uh, maybe some uh, acidosis, but very small uh, hyperchloremic acidosis can result out of it. But normally, with the amounts you prescribe in the um, surgical units, uh, you can't get that far with, uh, uh, with um, overloading with chlorides, especially because there's a lot of fluid lost during the surgery, and then you, you, it, you replace it, and there's a short time treatment normally. The problem is when it is prolonged, then you're right, it, is, it can be a problem, but normally it's not that much. Yeah, I, I was just gonna ask, you say that there's a lot of fluid lost in surgery. How much? How much fluid is lost in surgery? And if it's blood that's lost, it's blood that should be replaced. You can count it by hour. How much? Yeah, I, I will not give you at the moment, but uh, it depends very much uh, on the type of surgery. Norm general surgery is usually three, four, four liters in the first day has to be replaced. It's the menu. I think there may be some differences in different countries. If, if you look at Dilip Lobo's study, he's an upper GI surgeon. He's my colleague and professor of surgery in Nottingham. If you look at his study that was published in The Lancet, I think, on fluid restriction perioperatively, um, they, so they, ha they minimized sodium chloride infusion. The patients left three and a half days earlier, but we measured gastric emptying on them uh, as soon as they were mobile, and their gastric emptying returned to normal very quickly postoperatively, even though it was GI surgery. Whereas the ones who had standard treatment, they, their stomachs remained inert and did not empty for about five days. And, and this is the, the, the key so thing. So this is the key it. thing, that, that they must not be overhydrated. And, and, and it wasn't balancing intake against urinary, urinary loss, it was, it was restricting intake, restricting fluid infusion. But I, I think um, when, uh, just to add to that, I think in this recent meta-analysis, although Prof Lobo labelled this in his study as restricted, and in, the same, in this field, the same issue of definition applied, what they did is, uh, when they reviewed the literature, some people called it restrictive, but actually when, when they looked back, apparently it was, it was normovolemia, it was, that was what we're aiming for. It was called restrictive because it didn't give people lots of fluid, um, but it was normovolemia. And just to add to what you said about the chloride, just a recent study that was done from our unit, what Professor Lobo led, they looked at uh, healthy volunteers, MRI function, uh, functional scans of uh, renal perfusion, and they compared normal saline to plasma light, which uh, normal saline has a higher chloride concentration to, compared to plasma light, and they showed there was impaired renal perfusion in patients that in the subjects rather that received the uh, the um, normal saline because of the hyper or related to the hypochloremic acidosis, although mild. I'm, I'm just asking, where does three to five liters a day? Where does it go? That's an enormous volume of fluid. Yeah. Where is it going? First of all, into the intestine that I paralyzed. Third space, and you need to replace it. It's still water in the body, but in the wrong part of the body. It's inside the intestine mm -hmm. that are paralyzed after the surgery. Same happens in pancreatitis. Out of the blue, the, the, the way is the same. It's water shift into the third space. I mean, I, I agree, there is, there is change, there is th third space changes of, of fluid distribution, but uh, the body of evidence demonstrates that um, normovolemia in surgical patients is what we aim for. Uh, the surgical trauma results in fluid and salt absorption anyway. That, that's normal physiological response to surgery. So the key is to normovolemia. Monitor input and output and address that. Um, that, that is the key message at the moment. But we are talking volemia or hydration. They are two separate things. So, volemia Yes, so we judge that, but... It's the same thing. You can lose one liter of blood, and it's clearly hyper, hypervolemia, and if you lose one liter of uh, uh, sweat, it's, not, it's also one liter, but completely different fluid. Sure. So the impact on the cardiovascular system is completely different. I, I agree, but... Hypervolemia is one thing, hydration is another thing. So we, we, we measure the hypovolemia by, by, as I said, fluid balance by input and output. So provide, uh, presumably we can agree, I suppose, that if the kidneys are being perfused, there's adequate um, hydration, uh, adequate uh, blood volume. And as long as the patients are producing enough urine, then you can be satisfied that they're adequately hydrated. The key is not to give them uh, too much fluid.
completely different symptoms and completely different signs of both. And you, you could not to be, not to mix them, because most of the, the problem in clinical settings comes from mixing up hydration and volume. Dehyd severe dehydration comes with some type of volume. That's true. But you can't mix them. You have to be very careful. If you make, if you mix them, you make mistakes, obviously. Ron, would you like to continue? With, um, I, uh, I have another question on yeah. a slightly different topic from Professor Kunarik. So if someone wants to continue on this topic, I don't need a microphone. I'm wearing, I'm wearing one. I, and it, his question was about, about constipation. And there are certainly a lot of uh, epidemiological studies showing an association. What about intervention studies showing that improving hydration, looking at functional outcomes? And yeah. how do those compare with intervention studies looking at probiotics or prebiotics as treatments? Do well, you know? I don't know anything about the pre and probiotics. But what I can tell you is that um, that, that um, increased water intake has been shown to be beneficial um, in, in, two, in two ways. One, from the study I highlighted here, that is, is, is shown to increase the effects of high fiber diet. We know that high fiber diet helps improve constipation um, uh, and increased water intake has been shown from this study to help with that. It's all, uh, this, the, in kids and in adults, it's also been shown that increased water consumption reduces the need for, or the use of osmotic uh, laxatives. But, but no, no evidence that you were aware of in relation to the use of, of pre or probiotics. I, I, I can't comment on that. I have not something I'm not aware of, sorry. I think perhaps you can open the discussion more widely. Uh, Ibrahim, mm -hmm. oh, okay. yeah. I'd like to go back shortly to the question of uh, postoperative fluid management. And I completely agree, Ahmed, that, uh, that uh, normal volemia is a key question. But you shortly mentioned uh, hyponatremia, the risk of brain edema. And I think this is a second key point to, uh, to avoid, because <coughs> uh, in the early 90s, uh, considerable morbidity and mortality was described uh, also in, in, in children in the post first 12 postoperative uh, hours. And uh, that's why we propose and we use, and I think, uh, in, in, the, in the UK, this is similar, 20% uh, restrictive uh, fluid management in the first 12 hours. And we do it with an isotonic, a high sodium uh, solution with uh, balanced fluid, so with a low uh, chloride concentration to avoid uh, metabolic acidosis. And I think this is, this is very important uh, for, for brain edema. And this is due, this uh, postoperative risk of, uh, of hypervolemia and hyponatremia due to a non-osmotic activation of antidiuretic hormone. And this is this one of the situations what Larry uh, mentioned as when the system doesn't work properly. So what could we do to see if the uh, ADH is still highly active? We should monitor not only the input and output, but the specific gravity or osmolality of the urine. And to, to measure the specific gravity is very simple with a stick. So we can do it every three to six hours. And this is a simple method. And after 12 hours, we see that now the, the urine is not so concentrated. So, we, uh, so, so one more factor to output input uh, the specific uh, gravity or osmolality of urine. When I first started uh, doing my research, the first thing I wanted to do is uh, invent a, a urometer that had um, an osmolality measure on it, but somebody already beaten me to it. Um, they patented it, uh, but it's not used in clinical practice. So the idea would be what we do currently is monitor hourly urine output and select patients. And we feel that's a, a very sensitive marker of the hydration status, um, fluid balance um, in quotation mark. Uh, but I think, I think that I, I do agree with you. I, I feel there needs to be an additional uh, marker uh, and uh, you know, something that amalgamates uh, hourly uh, a urometer that monitors, monitors or measures your hourly urine output with osmolality, I think could be something to, 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 be, uh, you know, to be introduced. I agree with that. So when the, the osmolality goes down or the specific gravity goes down, that's the moment where I start to wipe up. Yes. The, the fluid management. Yeah. Under then, eighty percent restriction. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. <coughs> Thank you, Ahmad. Uh, shouldn't we think of the tonicity when we talk about dehydration and 
uh, hyper uh, hydration. So there is, we learned, there is so isotonic dehydration, hypotonic and hypotonic, so the different forms of uh, dehydration. It is I, not only one. I, I totally agree. And I, when I wrote my uh, review, I, my first paragraph in the introduction is exactly that. It's to highlight, um, uh, well, actually, it's the second paragraph. Uh, it's to highlight um, uh, uh, salt balance. You can't take, you can't just... Uh, take um, dehydration, um, broadly speaking, just like that. And this is, again, one of the problems that, is, that we face from the literature. Uh, th there isn't a standardised method to, to assess. Or in fact, uh, the methods are there, but people don't report those factors uh, in their studies. So we've talked about weight loss as a measure of dehydration. Um, we've talked about osmolalities, but in, in the context of salt and fluid balance, uh, salt uh, balance as well, that, that needs to be reported, yes. Um. <clears throat> I need to, to learn more about the impact of medication yeah. uh, on the mechanism, regulation mechanism so of sure. uh, water and electrolyte uh, household. Okay, so, so there, there are two things to highlight, and we've got some renal experts here that I'm sure can add to, to this. Um, the first thing is to consider, the first point that you, you highlighted is salt balance, so um, dehydration the contents of salt balance. Um, the other is, is the impact of dehydration on, on other organs, particularly the ki kidney. So if we take, uh, if, some, if somebody's on lithium, uh, it's a drug that's prescribed for um, mental health disorders, uh, bipolar disorder. And you take somebody on diuretics. So some diuretics um, result in um, salt, salt loss, obviously sodium loss. So if you com combine diuretics uh, with, or, with or somebody on lithium, or if somebody on lithium becomes particularly dehydrated and that affects their kidney function, they, I think, if I remember rightly, lithium can be absorbed into change, through the sodium channels, if I remember rightly. I don't know if anyone can add to that. So if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're on lithium and you become quite dehydrated, I suspect there's a, a risk of becoming, um, you, you know, get, getting high serum lithium concentrations, and that's quite detrimental. And does that... And that is taken into account, or in... The, uh, uh, well, regime. so so it's taken into account in the context. You should never prescribe diuretics um, and thiazide diuretics in particular with lithium. But um, what I'm trying to say, what, what I was trying to highlight is, uh, for me, it's, it's not necessarily people that are on lithium or, th or drugs like that that have a very narrow therapeutic range. What I want to highlight is just people on diuretics. I think what people need to be aware of is that, that you know, when you're on diuretics, if you're dehydrated or the, you know, it's really hot or have a massive heat wave, you've got to consider whether it's appropriate to continue taking those diuretics. Um, and ov obviously that has to be considered in the context of why they're on, on, on the diuretics. So that, I just think there needs to be better education. I wonder just if you can add to add that. To, well, I just want to add really to the last point you were making. One of the big drivers which increases risk for acute kidney injury um, is clearly an episode of dehydration so you go and get diarrhea and vomiting but when it occurs in people who are taking a diuretic which many old people are for a good reason or a non-steroidal or an ACE inhibitor then you compound your risk and so one of the one of the health education messages is helping people to understand that if they're on those medications and they get they get diarrhea, they just stop the tablets for a few days. And that would be an extraordinarily powerful way of avoiding, uh, you know, avoid it. it's, a, it's a health safety thing. You'll, you'll stop people coming into hospital. And, and again, that's the biggest problem, I think. I think we don't, as clinicians, offer enough advice with those drugs. I think they're th seen as relatively safe. And because of that, uh, advice isn't always offered. And some, pa some patients, I suppose not all, but some patients really are meticulous about taking their medication and they'll take them no, no matter what. So we need to educate ourselves as clinicians, but obviously educate patients as well. Thank you. Maybe it's only a comment regarding another time the group of population because as you're working in gastrointestinal, in, in cardiovascular, it's possible to define the different studies, which group of population, and more or less uh, in the review also specify. Uh, sure. 
what kind of uh, range of dehydration or chronic dehydration, as you were talking, there's not clear definition what means that in, in each study is considered different uh, values, but should be a way to define something that could be accepted? Uh, so if, can you just speak, so I didn't quite get that, the, the question. To create, to, to, have, to create a consensus regarding what is chronic dehydration in this, uh, from these studies, is it possible to take any kind of a consensus regarding that or no? Um, so uh, of all the studies overall, you mean? Yeah. I think the, the, the key thing, I think, as I mentioned before, we need to do more work. I think it's only in very few categories um, where randomized trials have been performed that, I, that you feel, I feel you can take the results and interpret them properly. The, the vast majority of the literature is associative, and, and because of that, you don't know what's the cause and what the effect is. You can make a guess, but you can't be sure. But also, as Larry alluded to before, if you look at osmolalities, urine osmolalities of different populations, they're different. Um, and you can't just, you know, do your on, on, on a population and decide that they're that that you know that, that group is dehydrated and, and uh, you know link them with certain conditions. It's 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 very difficult. But I think if we can agree a consensus that um, further work is needed or you know guidelines need to be established to in a, in a way to assess and uh, and conduct um, hydration-related research, particularly in the context of ill health, um, that that be a positive step forward. Um, most, of, most of what I see in the advice that's given to people suggests that it's better to err on the side of a little bit too much than a little bit too little water because the kidney will cope perfectly well and as long as you drink enough, the kidney will get rid of any excess. So the studies that have appeared in the last year or two suggesting that chronic overhydration may be associated with increased risk of osteoporosis, for example, are somewhat alarming to someone who's looked at that advice and said, yeah, that's probably sound advice. How, how good are those studies? Um, I think that it comes back to the original point that we made several times, is you can't apply one advice to everybody. There are people at uh, higher risk than others. Um, but uh, what I would say is that uh, various studies have looked at that, uh, particularly in the context of hyponatremia. Um, if you look at people who have psychogenic polydipsia, um, they're a group, again, that uh, studies people that drink lots of water for no apparent reason. Um, and there is a risk of osteoporosis in that group. So I think, I think if you want to provide sound evidence uh, to, or advice, rather, to the public, it needs to be evidence-based. And I, can't, I, I don't think we can just say, just drink liberally. I think there, 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 there are health consequences of that. I think we need to do the right work, that, you know, do the work and present the right evidence so we can uh, give good advice. Otherwise, people just won't listen. But one of the problems is people do listen to some of the advice. If it's advice that they find congenial, they'll follow it. So when I type into Google, how much should I drink? Uh, in the UK, the first website that comes up is some water website, and it says, drink more. It doesn't say, how much are you currently drinking? It just says, drink more. Yeah, I, uh, yeah so that's, that, that's, I think that's dangerous advice. I don't think that's the right way to go about it. So We'd be falling into the same trap as uh, yeah. some of the p published literature. So I think we need to balance the two, don't we? Too yes. much is not good and too little is well, not good. There's one study that said, well, several studies that apparently report, and if you look at bladder cancer, several studies tell you that if you drink water, the more water you drink, the higher the risk of bladder cancer. Um, so, you know, you can't, you can't just report things like that without, uh, without qualifying them. I think we need to be clear. And I think the problem is also that the public sort of, as, as Ron says, they choose the bits they want to hear, but they also misinterpret the bits they do hear as well. Yeah. So if you remember a couple of years ago, there were some deaths of, of, of patients on VLCDs, the advice for which was three litres of water a day, so they thought six would probably be a better idea. Yeah. At a time when you're, you're only eating, consuming 500 calories a day and you're, you've, you've got serious negative balance of most things, mm. that was not a good idea and it killed a couple of yeah. them. Uh, which wasn't my point, but th there were two points which were separate. The, the first is, I'd be careful with your slides, because the slide said decreased transit time, but you didn't mean that. Uh, well, did I write? Is that what I it's, wrote? It said decreased transit time. Me. You meant decreased transit. Yeah, transit, so, yes. so that you slowed transit yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. It was I longer apologize. transit yes. time. So, yes. so you need to be careful. Yeah, yeah um, decreased transit, yes. Yeah, the other, the other thing is the sort of frail, vulnerable, older patients that, that we, I think, are probably more concerned about here.
Um, and and the, the, the difficulty in knowing whether the sort of impairment of cognitive function that they might be showing is, is, is just was there anyway is a consequence of a change in hydration mm -hmm. status or a change in electrolyte status. Of course, yeah. And, and you know, sodium levels will have a big impact. Yeah. So, so from your reading of the literature, has anybody tried to dissect the water from the sort of sodium in those sorts of patients? Um, not in those. So there's only one study that I'm aware of in, that looked at delirium and it looked at delirium in long-term uh, care residents. And they, they looked at water consumption in the context of that, and they said that, they reported that um, with, every incre with every glass of water consumed per day, the risk of delirium reduced by 33%. Um, that's what they reported. Again, it's an association rather than a, um, a solid evidence. But I have to say that a cognitive function in the context of dehydration or hydration status and electrolyte balance in the elderly has not been looked at. What we do know is that sodium imbalance in the elderly is associated with cognitive impairment and it's incredibly common, mainly driven by uh, medication that they take uh, and a big proportion of those are a consequence of diuretic um, and antihypertensive drugs. Uh, I have a question regarding obstipation, and I think you showed one slide with a uh, stool frequency increase with drinking more than five glasses of water, yes. I think so. Do you remember the correlation? Because I thought it was very weak. It is a weak, I think it was a weak correlation. Because I, I think remember the values. Uh, I, can, I can look those up. And are you talking about... Uh, Sorry for... That's all right. Are you talking about... One second. Oh. I'll, I'll get to it in many slides. This yeah, one. this one. Yes, I don't, I don't actually remember the correlation, but certainly I can... I can uh, I can look that up for you, but yeah. um, if you look at stool frequency, and look at the table at the top, um, it gives you better figures here. Um, so this is the stool, number of stool. Uh, it's per week, or isn't it? This is per week, yeah. So you can see the, the differences, um, pre-trial and post-trial, yeah. um, and uh, the change. Um, and all these are statistically significant. Okay. I don't know what the correlation is yeah. with the graph. No, sorry. Anyway, I was wondering, because they uh, made, I think the group just be, uh, regarding uh, more water intake or five glasses of water and not yeah. total water intake or beverages, different beverages. So why, why do they just choose water? Um, uh, so why did they just choose water? Um, that's a very good question. Um, and, I, and I have to say that's something that I think is a positive uh, thing from the studies. I think when you do a study, you need to be clear with what question you're trying to answer. Um, should, if, if they looked at total fluid consumption, there, is, there, are, there are lots of studies that um, consider things in co coffee, tea, and alcohol to be carcinogenic or have potential carcinogenic effects. So I think should they looked at, if they looked at total body water, that may give con conflicting results. And in fact, indeed, that's what happened with some of the literature uh, looking at uh, fluid consumption and bladder cancer. Um, a lot, some many studies looked at various fluids uh, as well as total as well as water consumption, um, and and the results are sometimes difficult to interpret because there are criticisms where people you know talk about uh, confounding effects of coffee and tea and, and and things like that. Or milk or fruit juice, so it's water. So the water intake is there. So if I don't drink water, but I drink a lot of water by drinking milk, I have also a sure, water intake. Sure, sure. I, I think that I think they're two separate questions mm. that we need to answer. I, I don't think that the right thing to do is to necessarily, in certain not in all cases anyway, I don't think you should uh, amalgamate the two questions, but uh, yes, it's a, key, key, it's a clear point. Any other question? I have one. Um, I was reading in your manuscript, you have very interesting information about uh, water and pregnancy mm -hmm. and breastfeeding. Would you like to talk a little bit more about that? Okay, so uh, I think uh, I had to report that. I know nothing about that field, but I had to report that in my review because I really felt that there's a, a lot to be learned from some of the studies that were designed and reported here. We had randomized control trials that looked at in pregnancy looked at oligohydromnius. Um, and they, one study looked at fluid restriction of 100 mils over a period of four hours, I believe, and uh, or um, oral consumption of two liters of fluid. And they demonstrated that um, clearly that there was an increase in the amni amniotic fluid index or the amniotic fluid volume by 16% in those that consumed the two liters of water. That uh, was four hours later. And uh, in the fluid restricted group, to, or the ones that only had 100 mils of water um, four hours later, they, there was a reduction in the, uh, in the amniotic fluid index by 8%. So that was a nice study. Uh, others have also looked at 
um, intravenous fluid therapy to try and uh, treat people who have oligohydromnius and they've done uh, they've looked at water orally uh, intravenous fluids isotonic and hypotonic solutions and they've demonstrated that two liters of water increases uh, the amniotic fluid index quite quite clearly and quite neatly um, I feel um, regarding labor um, I think the question is outdated because uh, some years back uh, there was fear of allowing women to drink during or eat and drink during labor because in case they needed the anesthetic or a general anesthetic we don't do that very often um, people if they if they need an operation they often have a spinal so the risk of aspiration is is, is less um, so women are allowed to eat and drink so that some basically the the studies that have been done that uh, looking into IV fluids with labor basically uh, what they demonstrated is if you were allowed to eat and drink as normal uh, or you, 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 you you know li liberally um, and then you were prescribed faster rates of intravenous fluids they gave 250 mils an hour compared to 125 mils an hour uh, of um, isotonic uh, intravenous fluid basically they found there are no differences if you are starved then uh, guess you're not allowed to eat or drink then you're and then you get the faster rates of fluid then there is uh, the, the, there is um, uh, kind of a, an impact on the progression of labor so they looked at particularly at prolonged uh, uh, duration of labor and need for oxytocin um, in patients who have who have been induced does that does that make sense it's a complex topic with regards to breastfeeding i'll briefly mention there's been a couple of studies which um, both reported that De maternal hydration doesn't impact on the quality or quantity of breast milk produced um, but they are limited uh, studies but I do know that EFSA recommend that uh, you should consume if you're breastfeeding consume six to seven hundred mils of water extra per day to the normal women or, you know what, what women uh, consume sorry is that so, okay uh, when you look at the modern textbooks of internal medicine yeah you will see half of it is about infectious diseases, the other is autoimmunological uh, auto diseases. And this, some, uh, there are some papers now, uh, quite recently, regard, uh, dealing with hydration, not, not really hydration, but hypertonicity and high sodium um, intake and autoimmunological diseases, saying, okay, you need a uh, hypertonic um, solution to uh, stimulate lymphocytes and uh, the majority of problems we have with autoimmunological diseases comes from increased sodium consumption and not enough water uh, consumption of hypertonicity of um, uh, internal milieu so could you uh, did you read anything about this uh, and to, to, to share with us yeah sure um, what I can say is that I certainly I'm not an expert in immunology but I can say the literature alluded to something which I thought was quite neat uh, if you look at patients with upper urinary tract infections so that up basically uh, pyelonephritis um, there, there's there's some uh, studies that have demonstrated that increased fluid consumption improves your outcome because um, not only low, low osmolality helps the function of the immune cells. So that's one reason. The other thing is the kind of dilution effects or the wash, the, the flushing effect. So, so higher osmolality is thought to be, may, may impede the effects of your, your um, uh, immune cells. So again, an interesting dimension, but uh, I suspect it may be discussed later. You've focused obviously on the, the title of your talk, which was on adverse outcomes um, related to inappropriate hydration. And we talked a little bit about adequate intakes. And of course, by definition, the adequate intake is the amount typically consumed by people who are in good health, mm -hmm. right, who, are, who are free from those unwanted outcomes. And one thing that's always confused me is when I'm in Europe, it seems my adequate intake is two and a half liters a day. But if I go to North America, it's 3.7 liters a day as an adult male. So when I fly into Vegas to play the tables at the weekend, should I drink 50% more than I do when I'm at home? Might I clarify what it is that you're drinking and how much it costs? Uh, they don't specify. They is say it, water. Is it cheaper in... Uh... Well, they, they just say well, this is the adequate intake for water. It's, it's 3.7 liters a day, I think, in the U.S., and it's 2.5 litres a day in Europe. I, I, the, basically, 
I'm sure there is some evidence supporting these recommendations, and I, I don't think I'm qualified to comment on that. But what I, I just feel from my interpretation of the literature that there really isn't that strong body of evidence available at the moment that, that we can uh, go back to to be able to recommend a certain amount of fluid. Um, and, I, and I also feel that we shouldn't necessarily recommend a certain amount of uh, fluid input uh, intake in, in to, to everybody. I mean, we live in a world where technology is really is becoming a part of day-to-day -day, uh, life, and I, I don't know why we can't try and subcategorize categorize the population into groups, not just the young and the old, but perhaps people who are very active, uh, people who are not very active, obese people, and then people can just you know follow the guidelines and, and take what's appropriate to them. I think we need to to approach this. Uh, in a fresh light and, and uh, kind of move on. Uh, I think a lot of the definitions are from the 70s, maybe even before that. I think we need to update uh, well, our these, definitions. These are definitions from the 2000s. These are relatively recent uh, statements. And if, if this is indeed the average amount consumed by healthy people, and it's 50% higher in the US than it is in Europe, we should see different patterns of disease. So what are the epidemiologists doing about, about those things? I, I, we have different calcium recommendations and different protein recommendations. We're not here to discuss calcium. We're here, we're here to discuss yeah. water. We look at the same evidence, and the American well, yeah. version is different to the oh, European version. I mean, version. even within our uh, continent, I think in Europe, we talked about the normal osmo euro osmolality of the German uh, cohort that was so it was 800. Uh, people in Finland, I think, had a much lower one. I, yeah. I, I, I think you can't, n there isn't such a thing as one fits all. We have to get away from that. And that's what I mean by a fresh approach. We need to relook at the topic with, with new pair of eyes and, and try and do something, you know, kind of produce guidelines that really do match the evidence. But the physiology of Americans is not so different. They're sort of humanoid. They're, <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're, <laughs> It just seems a remarkable difference, a 50% difference well, in something as basic look, as water. I, I just, I, all I say is I think you should look at the evidence that they base this on. That's all I'd say. And I think that the, the, the diff that's all I'd say. Is there any evidence from what you should uh, bring, or it is only observational? Oh, this is observational. No, it's, uh, it, well, you may say it's not evidence, but if indeed there are associations between the amount people drink and health outcomes, then there should be, and if that's what the average person in the US is drinking who's staying healthy, and in, the, in Europe the average person is drinking a third less and staying healthy, you might expect to see some differences in disease patterns. And I don't know if there are any. It's but it shouldn't be precautionary because it's not a recommended amount. It's an observation of what people do. Yeah. It's, you, you, you ought to also want to say, you ought to wonder. I mean, also, the different, they drink different things generally. I think they, they may, that may be a, we've already seen that people drink different, different quantities of different things. I think it's a difficult one. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't have an answer for it. <coughs> <laughs> it, it, it didn't. It, it didn't work, did it? It didn't work. Um, I believe in his recent book, Tim Noakes made some sort of quote that goes along the lines of, "Thirst is the only consequence of dehydration." Um, obviously, he's making this statement in relation to healthy individuals. But in your reading, do you feel that that statement is is valid? Um, in a word, no. Um, I, I, uh, there's been a lot of publicity recently, I, th I feel, and there were recent past anyway about, about uh, 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 questioning people's motives for, for investigating hydration and, and outcome. But uh, I think all, all I can say from my, from my reading of the literature and my knowledge, and I'm sure, again, our renal colleagues can, can add to this, we know that dehydration can be you know, detrimental. In the elder adult groups, I know he's mentioned talking about healthy individuals, but in older populations, it's associated with morbidity and mortality. Uh, I don't think, I don't think um, you can make such a statement. Um, you know, and uh, I think that that's uh, entirely wrong. I feel that the potential serious consequences, potentially life-threatening, in, in association with dehydration, um, not not only in old adults, but I'm sure in, in healthy individuals. But I don't know uh, if any of the renal colleagues can add to this about the, the spectrum between dehydration and, and acute kidney impairment or acute kidney injury. Um, 
but I mean in, in the context of acute kidney injury, of dehydration. That it's a spectrum, isn't it, uh, from my understanding? Yeah. yeah. So severe dehydration will lead to acute kidney injury. Well, he's trying to sell books as well as, you know, so statements like that help sell books, I think. He also said that's true, up to 10% dehydration. Okay. There are no, no health outcomes. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, th this is the problem. The literature has, uh, you, you know, it's, it's supposedly peer-reviewed, but, um, uh, you know, th th there's lots of things that are published that, um, as I say, are questionable. I have uh, also a question. Um, sure. Uh, these, uh, most of these diseases have uh, a lot of uh, factors that uh, are, uh, that influence uh, uh, the development of the, the disease. Do you consider any of those uh, to be uh, mostly associated with water intake? I mean, in which ones do you think water intake is the determinant factor? Is there any or? Um. Well, for, uh, yeah. So there is no, there are no studies that have looked at people with certain conditions. If I understand the question correctly, so that people that have a condition and then become dehydrated and the progression of that condition is that is that what what you mean? I mean that the, if you look, uh, for example, uh, cardiovascular disease, yeah. you may say that uh, fat intake is the most important determinant. If you can say that, mm. or, uh, or calcium intake for osteoporosis. Do you think that there is uh, a number of diseases that mostly associated with water intake? Um, I'd, I'd, no, basically from the literature, there's no evidence to support that uh, argument. I, I would, my, again, from my personal uh, view, and I, I'm sure our renal colleagues can add to that, the, the only condition that I can really, uh, that I'm aware of where there is a real strong link between dehydration and impairment of a, uh, and, and the condition is, is some forms of acute kidney injury. In the case of oligohydromnia, as I mentioned uh, yeah. in pregnant women, there is some evidence that dehydration does reduce uh, the amniotic fluid volume. So, so, that, so that, that's something to consider, but that is not the only factor, or the, that is certainly not the main factor that predisposes to, to that condition. Uh, are there other questions? No. So as we move towards uh, finishing your presentation, I would like you to summarize, first, for which of the diseases we have evidence, strong evidence, that water plays a role? I think you, probably just oligohydromnius, maybe urolithiasis. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think basically that's as far as you can. And even then, you, you really... Um, pushing it out to say there is really solid evidence to, to support those, uh, those two conditions. On the other hand, we have a number of uh, situations that we have recommendations without yeah. solid evidence, such as uh, uh, breastfeeding uh, and uh, conservation. So yeah, breastfeeding, the EFSA guidelines, uh, Na National Con Institute of Health Research talk about increased <coughs> fluid consumption in kids. Uh, Euro there's the European Society of Urologists, I think, recommend increased fluid consumption uh, to help uh, with people who have got a history of urolithiasis. Um, constipation, uh, general advice from clinicians. There are many, many guidelines. I, I, I think the reason those guidelines are, have been, I mean, I, I don't know, I'm not involved in those societies and have not helped produce the guidelines, but I do feel that there, there may be the, the notion that, oh, you know, drinking a little bit more water is not going to harm you, therefore let's recommend it. But I, I feel the evidence isn't there to support those recommendations in most cases. And, and I think the key message is further work is needed. And then uh, we have uh, some major public health issues such as cardiovascular disease, hypertension or stroke that we do not have evidence or recommendations. But yeah. we do have mechanisms that we think that are involved. Yeah, uh, I, think, I think so. Uh, I think that one of the problems is uh, in some circles, hydration is not really seen as a really important uh, topic. So we, we know for a fact that well, one of the treatments for people that have uh, severe um, hematological conditions like uh, myeloma or where, where they the increased plasma viscosity, one of the, the treatments is to give intravenous fluid therapy to help dilute, uh, dilute that. Um, but but I, I think there's a lot of things done without solid evidence, but we just take them for granted as, as you know, they work and they're essential.
If there is, is there any other comment? So what would be your last sentence to that? What I'd say is um, we need to do more work. Uh, just quite frankly, uh, there, there, there isn't really much more to say than um, the evidence is lacking. I think we, as I said it before, we have a responsibility to, to highlight the um, appropriate methodology appropriate for, for this type of work, appropriate methodology to assess um, dehydration, a, a minimum standard, if you like. Um, and certainly we need to highlight that a lot of these conditions need to be further investigated in the context of dehydration. Thank you. Thanks.